Thank you all for being here. Uh, thanks to America for hosting uh, this and, and organizing it with us. And thanks especially to, to Cardinal Czerny for being here for the presentation of his new book, Siblings All, Sign of the Times. Now, it was written, and we should note, is co-authored with Italian theologian Father Michael Baroni. It's a work that traces the path of uh, social justice that Francis, Pope Francis has laid out, a body of teaching that is both radical in responding to the dynamics of our era, but also grounded in Catholic tradition and especially in the Second Vatican Council. Uh, I should also note that Cardinal Cherney is here for another reason, uh, to receive an honorary doctorate of divinity from Fordham University tomorrow at the baccalaureate mass. And just a few uh, biographical notes about uh, Cardinal Cherney. He's uh, head of the Vatican's Dicastery for Promoting Integral Human Development. Uh, Pope Francis has famously reformed the Curia, but one thing no one can do is make in better departmental names. I think we can work on that title, but that'll be for the next reform, for the next papacy. Michael Czerny was born in Czechoslovakia in 1946. His mother's family uh, were Jewish converts to Catholicism and as a result suffered greatly during the war and as well in the aftermath. And he was brought to Canada as a child. He uh, was educated by the Jesuits there, graduated from Loyola High School in Montreal, and he soon in himself joined the Society of Jesus. And in the years, ensuing years, has had a remarkable and distinguished record of service. Uh, Cardinal Czerny co-founded the Jesuit Center for Social Faith and Justice in Toronto in 1979. And in 1990, following the murder of six Jesuits and others at the University of Central America in San Salvador, he assumed the director's role of the university's Institute for Human Rights. He later worked in the Social Justice Secretariat at the Jesuits General Curia in Rome. And in 2002, he founded the African Jesuit AIDS Network. Since 2010, he's been working in the Curia in various justice and peace capacities. And in 2019, Pope Francis made him a cardinal. In 2022, the Pope named him prefect of the Dicastery for Promoting Integral Human Development, which is essentially the, the Curia's chief exponent for the social justice teaching and ministry of the church. And now, He's here with us, yet another feather in his Beretta, I guess you could say. So we're very glad to have him here. We're also very thankful to have my friends and colleagues, Christine Hinsey and Tony Annette, who are going to offer their reflections uh, on this book and on this theme during our discussion together. Christine Hinsey is chair of Fordham's, University, Fordham's uh, Department of Theology. Also, a very distinguished and, and long career as a Catholic theologian, recent past president of the uh, Catholic Theological Society of America. Her teaching and research focuses on foundational and applied issues in Christian social ethics, with a special emphasis on the dynamics of social transformation, Catholic social thought, and economic and work justice for vulnerable women and families. Christine's most recent book is Radical Sufficiency, Work, Livelihood, and a U.S. Catholic Economic Ethic. In that same strain, Tony Annette is visiting scholar at the Center for Sustainable Development at Columbia University, and Tony spent two decades at the International Monetary Fund, including as speechwriter to the managing director which will be many, many years off in purgatory for Tony. <laughs> Tony is a member of the College of the Fellows of the Dominican School of Philosophy and Theology, and his most recent book is Cathonomics, How Catholic Tradition Can Create a More Just Economy. We've got flyers in addition to selling Cardinal Cherney's book, which he will sign for you. We've got flyers uh, from Georgetown Press for both Tony's book and for Christine's book. And they've got a QR code, special discount 
uh, if you buy one this evening. So now again, this book and these books and this theme could not be more timely for our church and for our world. And I look forward to hearing from our speakers and from you all as we engage in this conversation. Here's how we'll proceed. Tony and Christine will offer brief reflections on their take on the Cardinal's book, Cardinal and Father Baroni's book, and on this theme of Catholic social teaching in the pontificate of Pope Francis. And then we'll hear from Cardinal Cherney to get his thoughts on their thoughts. <laughs> then we'll open it up to questions from you all, and I'll moderate that conversation. So first, we're going to go to Tony Annette. And um, please silence your cell phones. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. And uh, it's a great pleasure to be here with my good friend, Cardinal Cherney, all the way from Rome. Um, this is the second time we've done this. I was on the panel with him in Georgetown last month. So it's, uh, it's what is that? Is that another Jesuit university you said? There's a rumor to the effect. Yeah, yeah. Um, Let it that from the table. <laughs> um, I really appreciated Cardinal Cherney's book. I thought it's a wonderful addition to the th explanation of the thought of Pope Francis and Catholic social teaching. Uh, I really like the fact that it's so deeply rooted in the Second Vatican Council, and it really shows the organic link between uh, the magisterium of Pope Francis and the social realm and what the Council has to say to us all. So I highly recommend everybody get, it, get yourselves a copy of the book um, before it disappears. It's really quite excellent. And um, yeah, I think on the... When I think about the social doctrine as expounded by Pope Francis, I mean, there's a number of ways we can come at this. Um, I like to start from kind of the, the less uh, well um, popular elements. And there's two things there in particular I want to draw attention to. And one is his addresses to popular movements. These are these groups of people who really are among the poorest of the poor um, in terms of um, their desire to live a, to be active agents of their own development and, and the dignity of work. And Pope Francis gives, gave a remarkable sequence of talks over the years and addresses to these popular movements. And there he, he is, in my view anyway, at his most profound and at his most prophetic. Um, some of his most famous quotes like, this economy kills, this economy excludes, this economy destroys Mother Earth. These quotes come from his speeches to the popular movements. Likewise, I would point out that um, in 2020, in August, September, he gave a remarkable sequence of general audiences on the theme of Catholic social teaching for a post-COVID world. Now, I think he was a little ahead of the curve there in 2020, <laughs> but, um, but these, are, these, these are quite remarkable. He talks through what the post-COVID world should look like from the perspective of Catholic social teaching, principles like the common good and solidarity and the preferential option for the poor. And they're beautiful reflections. I always remember he talks about the two things we need to worry most about are individualism and indifference, these two eyes. And, and I think that really is a good summary of how Pope Francis approaches, approaches the church's social doctrine. Of course, I, before I finish my brief discussion here, I have to reference, of course, Laudato Si, which is his signature encyclical on, on, on social doctrine. And I noticed that he, he's always very clear, and I've heard him say this more than once. He always says, this is not a green encyclical. This is a social encyclical. It's directly in line with all the other social encyclicals all the way back from to, from, uh, to Nurem Navarum, all the way through to Fratelli Tutti, I say. And there, what he calls for in Laudato Si, from an economic perspective, is integral and sustainable human development. Of course, we all know what integral human development is. It's 
Cardinal Charney's dicastery. It's the development of the whole person and all people. <laughs> but sustainable development is interesting because that's the kind of field that I work in. And sustainable development is really this three-legged stool. It's economic prosperity, it's economic rights or social inclusion, and it's protection of nature. And I think, and it's no coincidence that in September 2015, Pope Francis addressed the United Nations during a, a special session of the General Assembly in which they endorsed the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, which are the world's goals between 2015 and 2030, which are, I would argue, map out the contours of the global common good in terms of what kind of, what the economy should look like. And there he is following directly in the footsteps of his predecessors. The concept of economic rights goes all the way back to, actually it goes back to Pope Pius XII, but it's most succinctly spelled out by Pope John XXIII in Pachamenteris when he lists, he talks about human rights, and he says the first rights, the first rights that we list in this encyclical are economic rights. Food, shelter, clothing, healthcare, education, social protection. All these rights are central to sustainable development. And Pope Francis puts it beautifully when he talks about the three L's of land, labor, and lodging. And these are his way of describing these economic rights. So that's kind of the way I look at Pope Francis's um, social doctrine. I will end by saying that he speaks out very strongly against neoliberalism and the idolatry of the market economy and trickle-down economics. He, he, he criticizes all these ideologies by name. Again, he's not the first pope to do that. Pope John Paul II also criticized neoliberalism. But Pope Francis does so in a way that sounds very urgent and prophetic. And I think that he speaks very clearly um, to those of us who live in the rich world. And all of us here do live in the rich world. And we need to take on the perspective of our poorer brothers and sisters. And that's really where Catholic social teaching begins. So I, I will stop there, otherwise I'm rambling too much. <laughs> <laughs> That's great, Tony. Thank you. Christine. I'm going to stand so I can put down my text that I brought. All right. It's such an honor to be here um, with the people up here and all of you there. Um, and especially to talk about this rich and engaging book that you have written with your colleague. In these few minutes, I want to lift up what this book analyzes and Fratelli Tutti exemplifies. And the book is really about Fratelli Tutti. Some of the distinctive features and the key through lines in Francis's teaching, which our authors show emerge directly from Vatican II and especially Gaudium et Spes's efforts um, to faithfully and practically read the gospel. This is a tradition that goes back to the gospel in light of our, the signs of our times. Your book convincingly, convincingly shows how much Francis hews to tradition. He's in continuity with Catholic and Christian tradition. However, as we all know, listeners both inside and outside the church have been startled by things Francis says about the church, about theology, about ecology, society. And you, we can ask why has who he is, what he says, and what he does elicited such strong and often contradictory, you know, polar opposite kinds of responses. One, one reason I think, I just want to reflect on that a little bit, one reason might lie in his capacity to embody and express a religiously grounded vision of social justice that speaks from and to the heart and actually cuts to the heart. He invites Christians to reflect on social justice as he does, from the heart of an intimate relationship with God and Jesus, from the heart of the gospel and the Catholic social tradition, from the heart of a solidarity that walks the walk of solidarity with and for the poor, the excluded, the vulnerable, as you were just pointing out. It's on the peripheries, peripheries of worldly power that, that seekers discover what is truly at the heart of life. And this is key to everything he has done since he became Pope. 
Here among the supposed nobodies and losers of the world, Christians are invited to see, to learn from, and to touch and be touched by the agonized face and suffering body of Jesus in today's world. Francis is profoundly incarnational and fleshed, spiritual and fleshed perspective and example grounds, a perspective on social justice that's the opposite of abstract. What comes through is a gospel rooted, visceral passion for justice that strikes at the heart, both the heart of the message he conveys and the hearts of the audiences who hear that message. A second thing I think that characterizes um, and that you are attuned to in your book, uh, Francis's social thought, is its Ignatian or Jesuit character. And as a fellow Jesuit, um, that would be something you as an author were tuned into. Years of steeping in Jesuit spirituality and practice in, has infused Francis's sense of the church's social mission with a distinctly Ignatian flavor. What do I mean by that? In particular, his approach to social justice reflects the double movement that actually Pope Benedict named as a gift and charism of the Society of Jesus, to abide very deeply at the heart of the church and to work at the frontiers of faith, culture, and the issues of the day. So going deep, but also going outwards constantly seeking the most effective ways to share the good news at the most challenging peripheries. Christians, Francis tirely asserts, are invited to a spiritual life that plunges us deeply into the merciful love of God in Jesus. And anchored in that divine heart, believers are impelled outward to witness to God's inclusive love and merciful compassion, quote, to the ends of the earth. Praying and dialogue and writing documents and sitting at desks, as you point out, um, uh, he emphasized, is not sufficient to abide deeply in the gospel imp impels us to outward movement, that's quoting Francis, into places where God's justice and love are most sorely needed. If you remain in the Lord, you go out of yourself. Another element I think that characterizes uh, Fratelli Tutti and his whole, his whole um, corpus of thought is, it is spirit attuned and non-ideological and also, it ha it di there's a dialectic between little ripples, small actions on the ground, and big change in terms of the vision that he puts out for us. Fratelli Tutti enjoins us to pursue social solidarity and care for the earth with urgency, but also with humility and attentive receptivity to the promptings of the Holy Spirit to a, what he calls a God of surprises. At one point, um, Francis invoked the ancient theologian's depiction of the soul as, quote, a kind of sailing boat, while, quote, the Holy Spirit is the wind that blows the sail and, we, and, and, and is the gifts of the Spirit. Without the Spirit's drive and grace, we don't go ahead. I think this is a great image for the way his style, the way he himself um, uses discernment, Ignatian discernment, um, as, and tries to discern himself the signs of the times. This helps also explain Francis's often expressed animus toward any kind of ideology. He doesn't like ideology, market ideology, you know, any kind of ideology, because he sees this as a way of thinking that mistakes partial truths for ultimate and complete truths and values. And by doing that, it tends toward idolatry and breeds power that's apt to become demonic. Whenever you take part of the truth and make it the whole truth, you're in trouble. By contrast, Christians need to navigate in our time and place with a firm but light hand on the rudder, certainly employing maps, but prayerfully attentive to the signs of the time and following where the spirit might lead. There are a number of things that come forth from all this, and you go through them very well in working through the, each chapter, really, of, of Fratelli Tutti. It's, just a, it's great to read Fratelli Tutti and your book side by side. It's just a really rich experience. I just want to focus on one of those things, and that's the focus on solidarity um, that you find in Catholic social thought, in Francis, and that you also um, mine in this book. Um, as you show in the book, a social mission is fully intrinsic to our, um, to our, to our mission as church and as Christians. And it's expressed in an incarnational solidarity that everyone is, is responsible for enacting. 
The reintegration with faith and life, again, the link to Vatican II, the many links to Vatican II are so clear. Um, it was at the heart of what Gaudium et Spes was trying to do, and the Vatican Council as a whole. How do we not make faith separate from life? And Francis exemplifies this. Hence, solidarity, which John Paul II well summarized as recognizing our interconnectedness, taking responsibility for our siblinghood, and then being willing to go out of ourselves in love to serve the common good. That solidarity in, in, in action, prioritizing the vulnerable, is our religious calling. He says we can't always we can't always reflect the gospel perfectly, but the one thing we should always, always be able to show is that we are paying attention to the most vulnerable in however we make our decision making. Francis recognizes that for members of Western culture enmeshed in the paradox, and you were saying the rich people of the world, like that's us, right? Enmeshed in the, the, the paradox of seeking security and peace through fear and mistrust. It's a great line in Fratelli Tutti. Um, we think we're gonna get security and peace by acting ways that, that express fear and mistrust, sort of, you know, like circling the wagons, taking care of ourselves, clenching our fists. Um, for us, entering into this kind of flesh-to-flesh, heart-to-heart uh, um, solidarity is scary and challenging. And as our authors say, uh, the poor by their very presence call into question the cultural status and universe of the West. That's a great line. Uh, practicing embodied solidarity in our seeing and acting restores us to reality. It's not following an ideal, it's connecting with us with reality, according to Francis. It helps treat the anesthesia of the heart, as he puts it, releases us from those soap bubbles of indifference that we've heard him talk about in our dominant culture. Discovering my solidarity, my mission to solidarity with my siblings in the earth helps me discover my authentic self, my heart of flesh. And when I wake up, to that, I also wake to my place among the, of the community of other solidary souls. This is a quote from uh, a wh Wales, excuse me, a while back. He says, all, the way, all around us we begin to see nurses with soul, teachers with soul, politicians with soul, people who have chosen deep down to be with others and for others. And notice that crosses all the boundaries of religious traditions. This isn't just about Catholics or Christians. As you underscore in the book, solidarity is at the heart of the mission and identity of individual Christians in the church and of the human mission that he sees for all of us of acting to build a peaceful, just, and sustainable society. And if we're going to change the big structures and deal with the big structural issues, um, it's absolutely important. And so it seems to me that Francis is trying to promote a culture both in, within and beyond the church a practice, a habitual way of seeing. Um, you talk about the Good, Good Samaritan, which, which, is, which is the parable that, um, that, that Francis uses in Fratelli Tutti as a parable of perception, which is a great phrase for that. It's, it's the way the guy saw, the, the way the guy looked. And once again, and this is my last paragraph, uh, <laughs> for advantaged first world people like me, two other salutary points in this book, uh, uh, I found in this book um, that, that struck me. First, for Francis, acknowledging and acting on siblinghood is challenging and it really calls for conversion. It calls for me as a rich person to change and that is scary. It means relinquishing, dominating control, and self-protection. With Gandhi, Francis recognizes that the greatest enemy is not hatred, but fear. And that's something I know in my own gut. And secondly, along with calling for unity, Fratelli Tutti and Francis respects the value and irreducible otherness and the mystery of differences between individuals, cultures, and groups. And you point that out as well. The Good Samaritan didn't presume or pretend to fully understand or be the same as the man he helped, but he acted as someone who honored what uh, sociologist Robert Bella has called the enduring association of the different. We're really different, but we're connected. And that is the reality which Fratelli Tutti lifts up and that this rich book reveals as a through line that threads from the gospel to Vatican II and to Francis's teaching in Fratelli Tutti. So we're in your debt. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Cardinal Cherney, some thoughts? I, I don't have time to write another book. <laughs> uh, 
I, if I, I'm, I would like to pick up one word from what, uh, what Tony said, not, not to criticize him, but to try to communicate one of the important things that I've learned from Francis and that is reflected in the book. And it's the word sustainable. Because um, I don't know if others have this feeling that the word sustainable is one of those perfectly good words. How, how could you ever be against sustainable? And so it, it has entered into our vocabulary as a positive adjective that we add when we feel like it to whatever we're talking about. But what I've learned from Francis, and maybe in a special way from the popular movements and his interaction with them, is that unless you ask sustainable for whom, you're, you're actually um, self-destructing the word. The, the, it is not sustainable. If it is, if it excludes, and much even of the famous sustainable goals continue to be excluding, they don't, they don't succeed because they don't really question the system. So they don't succeed in overcoming this kind of hidden um, self-deception, hidden self-deception that's sustainable. We can all pitch in because this is this is good for everyone. It's good for everyone if it involves everyone, but it doesn't seem to be involving everyone. So I think that's, um, that was just to, to take off from what uh, the, the otherwise very um, positive and remarkable things, which I've already, already learned from uh, Tony because we worked together uh, for over the years, long before either of us was famous. <laughs> Whereas this is our first meeting, so I can't say that. We have a lifelong, a lifelong work together, but I very much appreciated your, your reading of the book. And I don't know if I'm right, because I haven't researched this, but I wonder if, um, if the word solidarity, whether this, um, this wouldn't be a good example of the church reading the sign of the times in the sense of um, assimilating or making, um, I, I would say even normalizing a, a reality which I think a few years before John Paul II would, ne would have been considered socialist and uh, purely, uh, I mean, something for workers' movements, but not for the church. Is that right, historically? Well, then, that's, then it, it, it becomes a very interesting thing, because you, you quoted very well the, uh, the Gandhi quote quoted by Francis about, about fear. But if you ask what Francis himself is most afraid of, do you want to try to guess, or shall I give you the right answer? <laughs> the right answer, abstraction. Abstraction, which is a fear or a loathing that, that cuts a big swath, big, big swath. And I think that includes all of us Abstraction is another form of the walled, uh, you call them walled communities now, walled, walled uh, enclaves that we build around ourselves. And um, so um, another um, image word that I find very helpful for understanding what Francis is getting at, actually the way in which he wouldn't let any single person in this room off the hook because you might say, well, I'm not into solidarity, or I'm not into economics. Or, but with this word, he puts everyone on the hook. And that is with the, to go when he says, we need to go to the peripheries. Because the periphery is the periphery for each one. That doesn't mean it is subjective. It just means that in the way you live your life, the way I live my life, I have established the lines which make the difference between me and my world and the peripheries. And so the challenge is not to go to uh, Botswana or to uh, Bolivia or to uh, Appalachia. It's to discover my, our peripheries. What are, the, what are the alienations behind which we hide? And he says, uh, you know, you can start tomorrow morning or even this evening because it's right there in front of you. But you have to recognize it, and then you have to, uh, I would say, throw yourself into the Lord's hands in order to be able to face this, because it's it's quite it's quite disheveling, it's quite upsetting to to do this. But then we realize that the gospel is upsetting, 
and that um, um, yes, from a kind of um, public relations or political point of view, Jesus was quite a failure. So the, that's another thing that here in America, especially, we we find hard to accept because we're really into success. In conclusion, and unrelated, I think, to what both my dear uh, read, co-readers have said, but I, I feel like I should say this here because because I'm here now in in, uh, in America, um, and 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 I think Francis is too diplomatic to talk about this very much. He see uh, there are quotes, but they they're 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 few and they're a bit hidden. But uh, if you um, if you ask me now, the ten years that I've uh, lived and worked with him, and ask, well, what's what's going on that's most upsetting, that's most disorienting? I think it's the de-Europeanization of the church, and I don't know that people that us here in America that I don't know that we realize how European the church is has been, and how how much we have assimilated the European style of church, and. Um, Jesus never meant it to be like that. And Paul didn't mean it to be like that. Paul gave his life so that the church wouldn't be one sect. And we've sort of allowed it, or we, it happened that it got sort of sectalized by being so, by being associated with the European uh, imperial project, to, to put it in a provocative way. Um, so, uh, a Christian with whom I wrote is from Sicily, and um, I think I think he grew up uh, suffering from the uh, colonialism that a Sicilian lives with, and um, maybe that's what what in some ways permeates the book too—a kind of uh, a struggle to help set the gospel free from this uh, unhappy and in some ways fossilized enculturation. It was brilliant at the beginning, but I think that um, <coughs> with Constantine, it turned out to not be such a good idea. <laughs> Although we, we lost fewer people because of Constantine, I'm sure of that. Uh, Mr. Chair, is that enough? <laughs> I, I get the microphone back, thank you. More than thank you very much. Let's open it up to some questions. Uh, do we have some folks who have some questions for our panelists or counter, John? Counter proposals. Ca or counter proposals, yes, yes. Contr contrarian. Those who are pro Constantine will be privileged with that. Uh, <laughs> Father Cicero. Well, my family is Sicilian, so I appreciate that. <laughs> Did you um, suffer very much? <laughs> <laughs> the hands of the Italians? Yeah. Um, the thing I was thinking about was conversion, you know, in light of what you've all been saying, and going to the periphery, as you just said. Um, and, you know, we can come to understand how those of us from rich countries would be invited to that. <clears throat> but what about the poor? Um, how are they invited to convert, or are they? to conversion and to go to the periphery within their context. Um, First to the Cardinal. I'm so glad you asked that question. <laughs> because that's, um, well, we've already said that our um, department, otherwise known as the Dicastri, uh, is uh, saddled with a rather uh, clumsy name. But I've been uh, thinking about uh, development, and Christian has been helping me to think about development. And I suspect that uh, many of us here have a uh, short, uh, short-changed view of development. And uh, if we had an, a few hours or half a day, we could do a workshop on this, because we would start by finding out what each of us thinks of development, and specifically who, it, who it's talking about. And I'm pretty convinced that um, most of us, um, at first, think it's um, development is something for people who need it. And uh, I won't go into all that because you don't need to hear it, and it would take all the time in the world. But m my um, more or less dogmatic affirmation is that until you understand development as referring to yourself, 
you don't understand it. And uh, uh, that was hidden, I think, in your, in your question and in your division of the world and of all people between those of us who are well off and the rest. Whereas if we understand that development, that the subject of development has to be not necessarily first, but in, primarily, maybe primarily oneself, and that one has to recognize that one is, needs to develop, then our, and that uh, n there's none of us in this room who would allow someone else to be responsible for their development or the development of their children. This is something which we are ready to die for, but it's something that we impose on others. B by our very use of the word, we, de uh, we send development aid and so all, all that stuff. So um, our understanding of development is that this is another word for the human vocation that we're all called to, as Jesus says, to life and life to the full. And that uh, unless we fight for um, uh, everyone's agency, we're, we don't know what we're talking about. And in fact, we don't talk about it. Uh, development is not something we talk about very much because we think it's for people in, as I say, in Botswana or in Bolivia. Who needs, it? nobody here needs it, but they need it and we're generous in helping them with it. Anyway, that, that long and unhappy rap. But um, this, to me, is, is, the, is now the key to our work as a department, that we understand that development is something that, uh, it's, it's the equivalent of the life that Jesus wants for us all. And uh, to the idea that we, he could want it for us and not for others is so completely inconceivable. Um, but that's how our world is set up, which is sad, very sad. That, I love that you mentioned the word agency, and uh, that seems to be so important um, in Catholic social thought, but also in uh, properly understanding what Francis is getting at when it comes to development, and even his talk about the peripheries and the encounter with the vulnerable and so forth. The people on the other side, you know, if I'm encountering the vulnerable, they're not passive sub passive objects. They are persons that then teach me and then also help me to develop my, you know, um, stunted, um, you know, um, small, um, frightened, you know, uh, psyche and uh, cult and culturated way of being in the world. That is so radical if you walk down the streets of with the Bronx where I teach, you know, when you walk by people that seem a little different or scary or um, may want to talk to me that I don't know and so forth. And we're kind of taught, you know, put your head down, keep going, stay away, you know, and make sure you protect yourself and that's just how we even raise our kids you know be careful um, pr you know make sure you get an education so you're not vulnerable etc cetera, etc cetera. we put such a strong emphasis on that and the whole thing that I that I think Francis is is doing is appealing to us to realize that we are underdeveloped and we are and again it's tricky because you don't want to say well i'm just as poor as the person who doesn't have enough to eat that's not what we're talking about but but we're stunted i'm stunted and uh and so this encounter that i'm being invited and called to in solidarity is it's not me reaching down it's it's me be, being vulnerable too so so that's one reflection but then also like the periphery peripheries like you were talking about so that the peripheries for the poor are perhaps, for example, you know, the kids who show up in El Salvador from Fordham who want to get, you know, an immersion experience and they're inserting themselves for a week into the lives of these people with their own worlds and their own, their own dignity and so forth. And so part of them exercising solidarity toward these rich people, you know, we don't think of it that way. But anyway, those are ram also some rambling comments. I mean, just really quickly, um, I was trained as an economist, and the big questions you're taught to think of as an economist are things like, how do poor countries get economic growth? How do they converge with rich countries? How do you eliminate poverty? But Pope Francis really challenged me when I think of those questions, because when you think about it, every one of those questions is really denying the agency of the poor. 
it's all what we can impose from above or what we rich countries can do or what we rich people can do or what we economists or technical experts can do. But it never talks about the poor themselves. And I find as an economist, that's really challenging for me to think about. Um, so yeah, I think I'll just leave it at that. Yeah. I can't resist a personal testimony. One of the most moving moments in my uh, life with Pope Francis was at a meeting he was having with the popular movements. And these were these are um, uh, you know, rag pickers, uh, street dwellers, um, uh, housing occupiers, um, land, uh, agricultural land occupiers, and so forth. And he said to them with as much passion and clarity as uh, I can't even communicate, he said, there is no solution without you. There is no solution without you. That's about as close to dogma, I think, that Pope Francis ever gets to. And it, it's, it's absolutely stunning when you think about it. That room full of misfits and, and so on and so on, whatever you think, or whatever words come to mind, there is no solution without you. And it's not as if he was thinking about there's no solution for your daily life, no. So that's just a witness that I wanted to share on that. Can I ask you a question about that? Uh, I, I'm so struck with the theme of being the church of and for the poor. And I think that in more richer areas, you know, we think of the church for the poor, but you know, as I've gone on in life, I actually think the church of the poor, so it changes the peripheries and the center, like who is in the center and who is on the peripheries. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, certainly, um, uh, to sort of bring in another favorite word that we haven't mentioned so far, I think one of the, one of the great uh, discoveries that's happening thanks to the synod is the lived response to what you just said, namely, in, in, even in our wealthiest parishes, the poor are with us. There are poor people who, thanks to the synod process, for the first time had a chance to raise their voice, along with better off people who never had a chance to raise their voice too, so it's not, I'm not dividing it that way. But the fact that poor people of different kinds in our different parishes um, were like we are this evening, except I think they were usually in circles, um, that is, uh, that, I think that's what he wants. That's what he said. Uh, it's, it's not, and this is where we have to be a bit careful, um, maybe especially those of us who are overeducated, not to impose a kind of sociology on what he says and say, well, then th it's, uh, these are these concepts and those uh, processes. But I think very humanly, and I, th I think uh, he wants the synod to be the way of, of embracing, um, finally, everyone. Siblings all, as someone said. And thank you for translating it that way. <laughs> <laughs> Fratelli tutti, brothers all, got a little, did not uh, land well. And I have to just interject a, a, also a, perhaps a hot button topic, but I was just cannot get over the, um, the killing of Jordan Neely, the homeless man on the, the subway, which was a tragedy and a horrible thing. But the fact that it was cast as, the, the man who killed him as a good Samaritan, mm. just whatever one thinks of it is totally a misunderstanding construal of, of, of what the good Samaritan is all about. And it's just, and again, everything you're saying about entering into this world rather than eliminating the other, I think everything about our society was in some ways summed up in that awful episode, but. Please. I just wanna say quickly, I think all these tropes of fear or what keeping us from loving our neighbor as ourself. Mm -hmm. And that's what, I mean, all these tropes of fear, rather than saying, and I love, you know, the introduction in La Miserable about the kindly bishop who can go all over and never is afraid. And he keeps his door unlocked, you know, and that kind of mm. modeling is, is so important. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Do you have a question? It's You're like, back there, yeah. Comment. Um, I'm reminded of a woman theologian from Latin America, and I don't remember her name. She was talking about we should not be talking about uh, taking the option for the poor. 
but we should be taking the option of with the poor mm -hmm. and evangelizing the rich. Mm -hmm. Let me just repeat, she said, speaking of a woman theologian, you'll have to track that down from Latin America. So we shouldn't be speaking of the preferential option for the poor, but the preferential, preferential option with the poor. Thank you. Yes. Hi, Kevin Appleby, Center for Migration Studies. Uh, I have a two-part question. First, it's one of the symptoms of poverty and climate change is migration. And... Um, the Holy Father has made that a signature issue as well. Uh, one of the criticisms, however, from those on the right of the Holy Father is he doesn't talk enough about the sovereignty of the nation and the, that they have a right to control its borders. And in some ways that may harm his effectiveness, you know, in his message. Could you respond to that criticism, first of all? And the second is, it's been 70 years since Exo Familia and I'm wondering if there's ever been consideration within the Holy See for another migration encyclical. Mm -hmm. Insofar as I was in the uh, migration business until fairly recently, I'm, I'm, I think I can uh, fairly uh, confidently say no to the second question. I don't think there's, uh, I don't think that's a, in the books or on, on, on the paper for the moment. Um, I mean, this this might sound like a, a cop out, but I, anyway, I don't mean it to be a cop out. But uh, I think when we um, ask uh, Pope Francis to to speak in certain ways or to address certain things from a certain point of view, I sometimes wonder whether we factor in the uh, the complication that he is also a head of state mm -hmm. among heads of states, and that to um, just to jettison or totally jeopardize that relationship on a particular item, um, probably if we if we were aware of it, we would we would not advise him to do that. In other words, it's not, especially since it's probably not going to be effective anyway. Then why offend others? So, for him to um, uh, let's say go uh, compared with this, to say the the there's a the economy kills. I mean, at least he's not criticizing heads of state. But if he said, if he would, if he would say, and please don't quote me in the newspaper, if he, if he says, if he said the nation state is dead as a dodo, it's killing us, that, that probably wouldn't go over very well. I don't think it's completely false. It's at least it's an interesting way of looking at things. Um, so that's uh, that's a bit the uh, the question of the. Uh, I, I don't know that he, I ask myself whether it's up to him to figure, figure out this problem of, this, of the uh, sovereign state. Um, you, you would say it's, it is his problem because he's trying to be pastoral and people are not hearing his message because they're getting hung up on sovereignty, if I understood your, the point you're making. So let's, uh, if we look at it as a, sovereign, as a pastoral problem, a communication problem, um, I'll conclude by saying that there was there was a, a a moment, and I don't think he's repeated it, but there was a moment when I thought he came very close to, in a certain sense, meeting your request, when he has said that um, a, a country. I think he was talking in in somewhere in the Nordic countries in Sweden or someplace like. That. He he said a country is obliged to. Um, assimilate uh, strangers uh, to the limit of its capacity. I, th I think uh, if he was using uh, language dramatic, he would say a country is not called to suicide in its response to, to, the, to the stranger or to the, um, to the displaced. Uh, subtext, but no country is, is close to that. Second subtext, well, but maybe Lebanon is. Uh, or maybe Uganda that has taken in more than a million. Uh, how many more millions should they take? You know, so it's not uh, totally clear. But I think I don't know if you would agree. You you know so much more about this than I do. But that that there's a way in which he 
You know, the, his problem is not the state the, and the states and the, and the policies of states. The problem is the attitudes and the political expression of people. And, I, and I, I'm sure I'm a bit lost in your question now, whether, uh, whether that helps to explain maybe his, um, I don't know if you would use this word, carelessness about the sovereignty issue and it's the damage it's doing to his to the reception of his message about uh, the stranger. I, I, as you see, I don't really know. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, what strikes me listening to you regarding the question is also um, taking it back to the parable of the Good Samaritan. This is a question that comes up a lot when you try to teach, uh, as I do undergraduates who are looking at these stories and thinking about what does it mean to love the neighbor. And the question almost always comes up, where's the limit? Mm -hmm. You know, am I supposed to give away everything? I mean, Jesus does say that at certain points to certain people, right? And so, and, and, and they're taking it existentially, you know, they're trying to figure out that question as we all must. Um, but what's interesting about the Good Samaritan is he, he went to the periphery, it, he, he definitely did, you know, he, he, he gave of himself, um, but he didn't give him his horse. He did, he still went and did his business. He said, I'll come back and pay more if you need to pay. So he almost models the good Samaritan store almost models this, like within the limits of your capacity, um, beyond probably what you think is comfortable beyond probably what you would rather do for sure. But that there, there are finite limits to our abilities to do this. The second thing is, I, I'm listening and thinking, Francis is a pastor. He's not a political analyst. He's not an economist. Um, and so when he makes these statements, like even this economy kills, he's not, you know, you with all your with all your training, but he's someone who's looking viscerally at the people who are suffering and saying, it does kill. And it's not up to me to figure out how to think about the economy better, except to know that it's supposed to serve everybody and it's not, and therefore it's broken. And that's that's the bottom line, so. Can I come back to just uh, as we've got to wrap up in a in a few minutes? The yeah, I think Christine, that you you got at in your opening remarks, the question that came is why is there such a pushback? And look at you know I, you raised the issue of de-Europeanization. I think that's huge, populism, nationalistic fears, but you know th all these things you're talking about, the church has talked about for centuries. That's in the Gospels. And it's sort of cordoned off as this social teaching, this kind of parallel magisterium, this sort of secondary to some of the other moral theology. And it seems so central and that, you know, 40 years ago this year at Fordham University, Cardinal Bernadine first talked about the consistent ethic of life. Look at the pushback that there came to that. Now, Pope Francis is talking about more or less the same thing. You're talking about this. And there, why, why is there always such a, a visceral discomfort with so, even so many faithful Christians with this basic teaching? I want to put that to each of you. Tony, give the, give the cardinal a break. <laughs> Thanks, David. <laughs> That's why I'm here. Um, this is a really good question, and it's certainly a question I think about all the time. Um, I do think a lot of it has to do with, I'm going to be quite blunt here, the center of opposition to Pope Francis is right here in the United States. I think he recognizes that too. And I think that's a lot of opposition to what he has to say about the economy and the environment and the poor, because uh, uh, rich people in the U.S. often, they want a very safe and domesticated church that doesn't challenge them very often. And Pope Francis challenges every one of us. He challenges me all the time. Um, so I think that's a lot to do with it. But I do think that it's, it's here. The opposition is here. I don't think there's any opposition to him in Latin America or in Africa. I think it's from here. I haven't visited Argentina yet, yes. No, neither is Pope Francis. Neither is Pope Francis. <laughs> next year, next year, yeah. Okay, on, on, before I ramble on too much in the panel. Christine, you did answer it first, but. Yeah, I, I, I you know, I, I, I'm always thinking macro and very, um, very much on the ground, you know, and so a lot of my comments have been about me and individual people as an American Christian and so forth. And I think that's right. I do think that the pushback is partly fear 
and not what because we when you have things to lose or you think you do um you're scared to be open to something different um and he's preaching something really different not new but he's getting it across in a way the previous popes didn't get it across um and so there's that but then also the powers that be which america is in the middle of that but it's not just the united states it's the powers that be uh, represent a lot to lose by any big changes and uh and so that that becomes then an, an ethos and a whole dynamic you know that um individuals play into or they buy into and so forth and that manipulates people who actually you know would would benefit from what he's talking about into being against what he's saying so there's there's macro things and there's personal things i think that are going on here yeah. and my my comment will be sad but true um i ask myself whether the question isn't really why don't people hear some of what he, we're hearing tonight from the pulpit so that you get a kind of a break or a fault line between what the Pope says and some of us enthusiasts. We're obviously, we're not a, a large number or a majority by any stretch. But then um, Father Joe or Father John or whatever he is, uh, if he's got a firewall set up against all this for whatever reason, but the, the, oh, the censorship. Censorship. <laughs> <laughs> the fact is that. Uh, I think he's alright. Is it okay? Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I think I finished my point. I think that that's what the microphone was trying to say. Enough, basta. They've got your idea. God bless you. Bye bye. <laughs> Thank you, and God bless you. I'm glad we're hearing it from this pulpit very much, and we're going to wrap it up there. This conversation will continue. This is not an abstraction. This is a real flesh and blood community. We're, we're very glad that you're here. I hope you'll join me in thanking our, all of our panel, from Cardinal Christine and Tony. Thank you all.